late summer, 1995. The war in the Balkans stretches into its fourth year. Hundreds of thousands have died in the fighting. UN peacekeeping forces on the ground suffer from being held hostage. The fighting in Bosnia is particularly fierce. Finally, NATO aircraft strike back at Bosnian Serb positions in the greatest display of air power in Europe since the end of World War II. The fierceness of the attacks brings a halt to the fighting and is a proud moment for NATO's air forces who had endured long and hard service in the region. History used to remember Bosnia's capital, Sarajevo, because the Great War began here, following the assassination of Austrian Archduke Ferdinand, 1914. The bloody history of the Balkans receded from memory in more recent times. The cities and towns of what is now the former Yugoslavia became best known as holiday destinations. But the breakup of the country in 1991 quickly led to old blood feuds being rekindled. The nation was broken into Slovenia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro and Croatia. This is where the civil war began as the ethnic groups sought dominance in their own regions. The Serbs were the most aggressive in this drive, but certainly were not the only group guilty of what became known as ethnic cleansing. By 1993, the world looked on horrified as full-scale war once again was being waged in the Balkans. The United Nations organized troops for humanitarian relief and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, found itself on a war footing in a setting never imagined during the 40 years of the Cold War. But what could be done? Few in the West wanted direct outside intervention in the fighting. But the huge defense system created by NATO to ward off a Russian attack could be put to some good use. In March 1993, the United Nations authorized action to ban all flights by fixed-wing and rotary-wing aircraft in the airspace of the Republic of Bosnia. While the ground fighting would continue, NATO could at least ensure that Bosnia would not become an unbridled air war as well. A close eye would be kept open for the air force the Bosnian Serbs had acquired. Operation Deny Flight, at first, would be aimed largely at this force. The no-fly zone of a Bosnia went into effect. It would be an operation that would include hundreds of aircraft flying thousands of sorties. The operation began with France, the Royal Netherlands Air Force, and the American Air Force. Soon, they were joined by other NATO nations, including Britain. The initial deployment included six Sea Harrier fighter aircraft aboard HMS Invincible, steaming in the Adriatic. This would be the most significant deployment of the Sea Harriers since the Falklands. Specially designed Wessex helicopters would provide electronic surveillance of the area. These were equipped with early warning radar modules that provide long distance security.
bridge is the heart of the ship. The ship's position is critical for the aircraft. Altering, uh, zero 70. Altering 070. Altering 070. Twenty starboard Very good. Midships. Midships. Though equipped with the world's okay. most modern electronic equipment, a pair of sharp eyes is still a valued yeah, naval okay. tradition. The ship's head at a range of about six miles yeah. While these NATO ships were powerful, a vigilant eye had to be maintained for any enemy. A small boat or missile could do tremendous damage to one of these great ships of the line. Sea Harrier pilots receive a briefing over their next assignment. While having conducted hundreds of training flights, these operations were now being flown over a country filled with hostility, which added a sense of both urgency and dedication to the mission. While the Harrier is capable of direct vertical takeoff, that maneuver expends large amounts of fuel. The ski jump ramp on the flight deck allows the Harrier to take off with a larger payload and fuel capacity than lifting straight up would otherwise allow. Landing, however, when the aircraft is lighter, is still made vertically. This is a safe and efficient use of the limited amount of deck space given over for fixed wing operations.
10 French Mirage 2000 fighter aircraft were based at the Servia Air Base in Italy. not directly a part of the formal NATO chain of command, French forces in Bosnia have operated within NATO. Mirage 2000 is a frontline medium or high altitude interceptor and air superiority aircraft. It has been adapted over the years as an attack aircraft capable of carrying nuclear weapons. It carries terrain following radar. The Dutch Air Force ultimately based its 12 F-16A fighter aircraft at Villa Franca Air Base, also in Italy. Uh, we arrived on the uh, 7th of April, and uh, so we've been in for four months. Uh, we started out uh, in support of uh, uh, UN Resolution uh, 816, and as of the 22nd of July, we re-rolled uh, six of the 18 aircraft uh, uh, to do uh, uh, air-to-ground operations. And as of the 22nd, uh, we're ready to receive tasking if uh, the UN so decides. How many flights did you carry out so far? Uh, we carried out uh, approximately 700 mission, uh, missions over Bosnia. On top of that, uh, we did a lot of training as well, because we need to, uh, to maintain our uh, level of training, of course. And so the total number of hours we've flown is around uh, 3,000. The Dutch Air Forces bought their F-16s in the so-called deal of the century. The airplane is valued by the Dutch because of its versatility, capable of both air-to-air -air combat and ground attack. The Dutch had a particular interest in providing close air support in Bosnia because of the sizable contribution they made to the United Nations ground contingent. The F-16 is capable of all-weather flying and therefore night missions as well. This capability was important during deny flight. Based at Italy's Aviano Air Base, with 12 U.S. Air Force F-16C fighters and eight U.S. Marine Corps F-A-18D fighters. The American Air Force made up the largest contingent of planes in Operation Deny Flight. 
Like their comrades in the Dutch Air Force, the F-16 is the prime line fighter for the Americans. The F-A-18 Hornet, used by the American Navy and Marine flyers, is a workhorse of an aircraft capable of carrying a large variety of weapons. Its two-man cockpit gives an extra margin of safety with the radar operator able to keep a close eye on the large array of sensors available to the pilots. It's worth having been proven in Operation Desert Storm. Operationally, the Americans, like the other air forces, fell under the multinational NATO command. These NATO aircraft pursued their mission virtually round the clock. Meanwhile, the war on the ground intensified. Many ceasefires were brokered by the United Nations. All were broken almost immediately. Increasingly, the United Nations troops on the ground became targets of hostile fire. Strict UN rules of engagement frustrated many of the troops who were lightly armed and stretched thinly over a wide area. Terror attacks against civilians mounted. This news report was typical during one of the many failed international attempts to negotiate peace. A new departure for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Its warplanes are enforcing a no-fly zone against Serbian aircraft over Bosnia-Herzegovina. It's NATO's first deployment ever to a combat zone. Since the onset of civil war last April, all peace efforts have failed in the former Yugoslav Republic. There's little guarantee this one will succeed. Only a few hours earlier, these children were playing. Then shells hit their school in Srebrenica. No sooner had the latest sanctions come into force than the Serbs were showing the world what they were capable of. Even though their leaders had just promised to honor a newly declared ceasefire, within minutes of the pledge, scores of innocent lives were shattered. Even United Nations trucks taking food to the starving or evacuating wounded Muslims are at the mercy of attack. The Serbs now control almost three quarters of Bosnia. A year into the conflict. UN forces have stepped up patrols to try and scare off the snipers. But they fail to stop the killing, the ethnic cleansing, the rapes. And they're running out of options. Muslims call this the Wailing Wall, because at least one person is killed along here every day. A year on, they're showing the world that the spirit of Sarajevo is still alive, for how long is sadly beyond their own control. For a time, Operation Deny Flight was successful in keeping the skies free of belligerent air activity. This changed, however, in late February 1994, when American F-16s on patrol were attacked and shot down four Bosnian Serb Air Force light attack aircraft. It was the first direct outside military intervention since the war had started, and the first time the NATO command had ordered shots fired in anger in its history. By now, NATO aircraft had been authorized to directly support UN troops on the ground. Britain augmented her fighter aircraft with Jaguar attack planes. The situation was becoming more dangerous for all the participants in the Bosnian conflict. Equipment you should 
have a Naughty Guide, Crypto, GPS, Video, CBR, Tape, and Carne. We still have a gun and ammo, money. Backseaters are either a camera, stabiscope, MVGs you don't uh, need, and I suggest you take some water. The Tornado F-3s were the prime British air superiority aircraft in deny flight. However, behind each pilot was a large number of support personnel who kept the planes in the air. But as always, it was the pilots who would face the greatest dangers. has a completely different role to the Harrier, which is close air support. Our job is their defence operations, and our aircraft is optimised for finding other aircraft, be it helicopters, transport, or fixed-wing aircraft. We have various equipments to help us do that. We have a radar, which is optimised for long-range detection, and we have missiles that we can use at long range or close range, and we have a gun. We also have various bits of equipment that help defend ourselves if we need to. RAF planes were refueled from a fleet of tankers. This technique was perfected during the Gulf War. It kept the planes available to keep pressures on the warring parties. far more difficult than, for example, Desert Storm. Because in Desert Storm we had one enemy. Here there are many factions involved. Politically it's more sensitive and we have a lot of UN troops dispersed throughout the area. So in terms of making a political decision to prosecute attack, that is a difficult decision. And to make sure we don't cause any fratricide, that is difficult militarily. So overall it is a very sensitive operation, both politically and militarily. Sometimes we're on a start up taxi takeoff. Uh, we got into our jet, we had no problems, and we were quite happy with all the systems. They all checked out fairly quickly. You heard yourselves come up in good time. You seem to be fairly, uh, uh, fairly okay, serviceable. The spares were both on frequency, they sounded okay, so they would have been there had we had any problems. Operations required the pilots to be able to identify specific yeah, targets, such as vehicles. This requires close attention. Okay. In maintaining the aircraft, support personnel used a variety of high-tech electronic sensors to keep track of the thousands of parts and mechanical systems in each aircraft. Without it, the aircrew won't go flying. So we have to do a confidence check basically for them. We have a test box which will interrogate the, the aircraft, which we'll send out a response to them. They'll respond to us. If we don't get the correct readings, then we'll tell them. If he doesn't, the aircrew don't get the correct readings, they'll indicate to us and they won't take it. If they don't get that, especially if we have a mode four things, which is an international thing, mainly used by Americans now, and which we've got to use out here because we're working with the Americans. If they don't have that, then they won't go flying. Regardless of the technical crews, each pilot in the final analysis is responsible for his own air safety and the success of the mission.
No, we don't actually want to be dropping the bombs. It's a threat of dropping the bombs, I think, that it's about. Uh, the flexibility, you know, we get airborne, and you can tell us to go anywhere in the theatre, and we can go there. We've got the fuel, we've got the range, we've got the bombs that we carry. And again, it's, you know, carrying the big stick, if you like, the threat. You know, we all hear about drawing the lines in the sand. Well, we're part of that. I mean, we are that line. You know, you step beyond it, the guys on the ground then can call upon us, you know, to give them some help. The American Air Force A-10 attack aircraft were ideal planes for duty during this stage of the Bosnian War. It could operate in the environment for which it was designed, that of a tank killer. In the summer of 1994, Major Mike Tyson's unit was deployed to Bosnia. His experiences were typical of airmen during the campaign. And it's a great machine. You've got endurance, you got capability, we carry more armament. We everything from uh, Willie Peep marking rockets for the uh, forward air control role, to Maverick missiles, to AIM-9 uh, sidewinders for self-defense, to our GAU-8 uh, cannon, 30 millimeter cannon that we have in the front of the airplane, which is really the business end of the A-10. And that's really what the airplane was designed around, and that's what we use as our primary weapon. The Bosnians like to fight in the summertime. They don't like to get their feet cold in the wintertime at all. So you know, when you see action occurring, it's during the summer. And that summer, we did get some action. And in particular, I can remember one mission that uh, kind of came about just as the normal turn of events in politics go. But, uh, on 5 August, actually the night of 4 August, the uh, Bosnian Serbs removed some uh, heavy armament out of one of the UN weapon storage uh, facilities. I came in in the middle of the night, took it out, and the UN decided in retaliation for taking that equipment out under, under force, basically, uh, was to do an airstrike the next day. So uh, NATO command came up with a whole airstrike to basically slam the Serbs uh, in some of the command and control targets that are around Sarajevo. Well, that, that package was reduced by NATO's bargain between NATO and between the UN, because there was a dual chain of command at the time. Uh, got it reduced to only hitting five or six targets around the area. And these were targets that were known, uh, vehicles that were in known locations, et cetera, or AAA sites or artillery pieces. So certain targets were delegated or designated for an airstrike that day. And uh, we didn't know any of this. And uh, I flew a training mission that morning with my wingman. And we went to a typical area near Mostar and worked with a uh, Malaysian ground forward air controller and we used uh, some British Jags to hit some ground targets, and these were just simulated attacks, just practice, and that's primarily what we did over there. And then we landed about three and a half hours later, and we were told that we were going on alert. And that was interesting, because that didn't happen very often, and especially since we already flew, you know, the last thing we thought we'd do is go, you know, actually fly again. So we came into the squadron, and then we got briefed up about all the uh, ground situation that was going on, and then found out, hey, you know, things are happening, and we can actually get involved in some real combat here which was unlike the norm in Bosnia, because most of the time it was just political aspects that were going on there. And, you know, little skirmishes were going on the ground. The Bosnians would stop a UN convoy, some little problem. They'd ask you to fly over to low altitude or something like to get the convoy moving again, do a little threatening type action, but generally never anything where we'd be scrambled on alert and actually asked to employ. So we got on the ground and we realized real fast it was becoming quite serious this time. So uh, we briefed for our mission. We knew some vague target areas that we're going to. And uh, within two hours, we were launched. So we got to our target, and uh, there was a big thunderstorm sitting over the top of it. So it made it somewhat difficult to work around. But I asked my wingman if he felt comfortable going below it. And he said he did, and we worked our way around it. And so we got uh, underneath the clouds, and we were in a position where the visibility wasn't great, but it was workable and the ceiling was workable, and we found the uh, primary target after working with a NATO ground fac, uh, actually a French ground fac. The fac, or forward air controller, and the A-10 pilots both had to follow strict guidelines before air control would grant permission to attack. Before this could happen, the crew was forced to return to get more fuel. Roger, starting tracking low speed, no sorry. Weapon controller, your mission will be identification. So we're in that position, we had to leave. And I remember going out, uh, climbing out and uh, heading back home. And I figured, well, that's, that's it for me. 
you know, it's time to go back. It's been a long day. We know it started at 5 o'clock in the morning. This is about uh, almost 5, 6 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, 12-hour duty day. And that was it. They're going to send us home. Well, I got talking to the command system again. And it's back to the tanker right away. Get another load of gas. So we're beaming down to the tanker. And uh, this is where it gets interesting because uh, I figured they'd never send us back to the same target. They'd find somebody else to go in there and hit it. So we went back to the tanker, and uh, my wingman did a great thing. You know, he uh, talked, you know, we were, when I was talking to the tanker and coordinating the rejoin, you know, he asked if we could hit the same target because we had met all the criteria and had found it and had coordinated everything. And they said, sure. Uh, they had nobody else that we were to be sent right back to the same position. So we took a full offload and then headed back in. And so we said, well, okay, this time it's going to happen. We decided to go with the Gow 8 cannon because the weather was marginal. Visibility was down to probably about two miles or so. And uh, with the Maverick, I'd been a hell of a heads down. And I knew that uh, my one shot deal on this thing to do, you know, was kind of get in there, shoot this thing, and get away with it before the Serbs would open up at us. Because I figured it would take them time, because we'd been flying there a long time, and rarely were we shot at. Uh, and I figured that we could shoot at them, and it would take them a little bit of time to get to the position where they could start shooting back. And they know that the game is up. So uh, we went in with the gun. I rolled in first. I sent my wingman to a combat uh, trail formation, which is basically behind me a couple thousand feet, about three or 4,000 feet behind me. We rolled in. Um, I opened up with the, uh, with the gun. I got some good hits on the first pass and pulled off. And I still remember the one sight of uh, pulling off the target watching all the smoke come off the target from the dust and, and stuff, you know, kicked up by the Gowite cannon, and watching two roll in and shooting. And uh, I'm pumping out flares all over the place. The sky is full of flares. You know, they're pretty bright because it was kind of an overcast day and stuff like that. Smoke all over the place. And, wow, this is fun. <laughs> the adrenaline rush among airmen in situations such as these is not at all uncommon. The adrenaline would keep their senses keen long enough to precisely do their jobs while avoiding civilian casualties. Keeping track of all this activity in the air is the job of the men and women serving in the AWACS and the AEWS, Airborne Control Planes. Virtually any aircraft is capable of being equipped with electronic control capability, but the American-designed E-3 Sentry is a favorite among those nations serving in the Balkans. The E-3s fly under the U.S. Air Force, RAF, French and NATO livery. Based on the Boeing 707 airframe. Three RAF E 3D NAEW aircraft have been flying in the Balkans. This mission was just like hundreds of others flown over the tent area. The assignment begins with the briefing. MO3 1301. Um, bits of note to you. Uh, you should already be aware of ACO changes two and three. I, I assume you've been informed of that at uh, Waddington. We've also put in, um, I think it's called threes, who've uh, been flying out to the past. The Sentry is designed for long flights. The planes are capable of staying aloft 11 hours, more if they're refueled. Only the lubricants in the engines prevent the planes from flying more than 24 hours without landing plane is very stable. This is critical for the crew who man the complex of radar and electronic sensors in the main cabin of the aircraft. They can keep track of planes for hundreds of miles all around. actually here to provide the ground commanders with the fact that an aircraft is airborne. That's the, our primary job, to provide early warning is our primary job. So it, if, as soon as we spot it, we will use a different, well, effectively it's a different symbol for a serve aircraft that's recognized, and that is then linked to the ground, and they get it immediately real time. So then, and then I'll back that up with a voice report and say what we can see. 
and then it's literally passed to, to a higher authority as to what action they're going to take from there. And then we, we work from their commands. So the fighters are there, they're always there, but we're going to work from the higher command as to what we're going to do with, their, with any enemy aircraft. The consoles display hundreds of individual bits of information for the crew to sort out. Computers are useful, but pencils and papers are still required for keeping track of the skies. Every day we are issued with this friendly air movement uh, sequence, which is, um, has all information about the United Nations flights into and out of uh, Bosnia. It, is, it enables us to identify by time and place uh, and by other means uh, all aircraft that uh, have been given permission by the United Nations to fly within Bosnia. Most of the unknown contacts in the no-fly zone are helicopters. These are, we presume, are transport helicopters, uh, maybe shifting generals or, uh, or other or troops around. If we pick up something that we do not have any identity on, we have to issue a warning on the international guard frequency, telling them that they are breaking the United Nations resolution and that they must land or depart the area immediately. The pilots of the aircraft have very special mission requirements to fulfill. user-friendly, so it takes a fair while to decode the information to work out actually what could be causing the problem. The system has a, it has a built-in test facility, which is continuously running once it's calibrated. And uh, every nine seconds or so, a particular test is run. If it's calibrated and checked out SATIS, then obviously it just moves on to the next test. If it fails, it is present the information in a octal format to be decoded by the technician. Among the heroes of the Bosnia air operation were the pilots and crews of the hundreds of C-130 Hercules transport aircraft that made the long and dangerous run to take supplies to Sarajevo, to airdrop food, medicines and other vital supplies to isolated civilians. The precision parachute drops were one of the greatest challenges to the pilots. The airdrops were particularly difficult as they required precise navigation. It's very difficult. Um, the parameters obviously go uh, to a larger size drop zone. Uh, the thing that we have that helps us out with the uh, CDS drops that we were making is um, high velocity parachutes. Uh, the the uh, drop object or the CDS that we're dropping, the food, the, um, you know, the blankets and things were contained in a, uh, what we call a CDS, a container delivery system. And after that, we dropped them from 16,000 in these high-velocity parachutes that aren't as affected by the wind as normal parachutes would be. And it allows it to hit the ground at about 50 miles an hour. So they're, they're coming out of the sky much faster than they normally would. And that increases our accuracy from high altitude. Even flying directly to Sarajevo Airport proved to be hazardous. The threats were pretty much the same, except that the, uh, they had set up a corridor that went into the uh, Sarajevo airport that uh, they required you to fly a very steep approach in there to keep above some of the, uh, the small arms. 
but uh, the, the surface air missiles could still reach us. Uh, you stayed as high as you could for as long as you could and went as fast as you could and still trying and, and still make it on the ground. Uh, the problem with an approach like that is it, it'll oftentimes make you overshoot the runway. So you have to plan your airspeed and, your, uh, and calculate your glide slope to make sure that you don't uh, overshoot the runway. Because if you had to go around in Sarajevo, the, uh, the mission was an abort. You basically departed and you, you didn't come back around and land. And that was due to some of the threats that we had encountered. The reason I like the mission is because it, most of the, the things that we were hauling in were, uh, was food and humanitarian supplies, um, blankets and clothes that the people could use. And after landing in Sarajevo and seeing the conditions and, and each and every building that, that I could see, as far as I could see, having a hole in it, you know, and, and what typically I'm sure would have been a beautiful city because it's set in the mountains, uh, was, was being devastated. And uh, to, to know that I was part of that relief, bringing some food and uh, supplies for these people, I, I thought was uh, excellent. By the early summer of 1995, the world was losing tolerance for the carnage being wrought in Bosnia. Renewed Bosnian-Serb aggression prompted limited NATO airstrikes. The Serbs challenged the NATO planes with missiles. One downed American F-16 pilot, Captain Scott O'Grady, who hid for six days before he was rescued. He became an instant hero to the Americans. People I want to thank are the people that came in there and risked. Uh, they say they did. They're just, they were just doing their job, but they uh, they came in there. They risked their lives to get me out. And, uh, those are the people on the USS Kearsarge. The men and women of the Navy and the Marines came in there and saved me. And uh, if you want to, if you want to find some heroes, those that's where you should look, because those are the biggest heroes in the world. Of course, if you want to ask me who the hero is. So that's all I've got to say. I'm getting pretty emotional right now, so I'm going to cut it off right here. And again, thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you. Bosnian Serbs pressed their attacks in the countryside. The limited NATO strikes did little harm. The so-called safe areas were overrun in spite of threats and protests from the United Nations. Finally, in July, officials from the countries providing troops to the UN effort, plus the United States, met in London. They resolved once more to call an end to the conflict. Things appeared different this time. World public opinion seemingly had reluctantly come to the conclusion that strong-armed intervention would be the only way to end the fighting. NATO was ordered to prepare for vigorous air attacks on the Serbs. The European Rapid Reaction Forces moved into position in Bosnia. The stage was set for confrontation. The Secretary General condemns unrid sir. The Bosnian Serbs had ignored many other NATO warnings without suffering retaliation. Apparently, they viewed NATO's new threats as empty as previous ones. They were wrong. At the end of August, the Serbs renewed the shelling of Sarajevo. Once again, city streets ran red with the blood of women and children. But this time, NATO struck back. Operation Deliberate Force was underway. The Rapid Reaction Force unleashed a barrage of 600 rounds of artillery. 
Scores of NATO aircraft struck hard and repeatedly at Serb positions. NATO had gone to war in the name of peace. This time it's a UK GR7 Harrier aircraft, once again on an ammunition storage depot. The results of our strikes have, in my, in my assessment, been very successful. I must tell you that we've had some weather problems. We've obviously missed some targets. But overall, I believe that we are being very successful in the prosecution of these air operations. The precision and ferocity of these NATO airstrikes actually pushed the warring parties to a conference table in the United States. The resulting treaty brought a moment of relative peace to Bosnia. Air power had been the most important diplomatic tool of all. <laughs> 